SUVs are everywhere. It seems that every new car you see on the road right now is an SUV. They might have a stupid name like crossover or subcompact, but they're still SUVs and they all seem entirely unnecessary to me anyway. I don't like it. They're big, heavy, worse on fuel, often more cramped than the equivalent of state car or station wagon if you're someone who calls aluminium aluminum. But I must be wrong, surely. Everyone else seems to like them. So what am I missing? Well, I did some digging to see what's going on here. But first we need to test my anecdotal evidence. And so in the name of science, I set up a test outside the office to count how many SUVs drove past compared to regular cars. So Will counted saloons, hatchbacks and people carriers, and I took the estate, sports cars and SUVs. It was going to be interesting to see who got more here. <laughs> we are doing God's work. So we took 15 minutes and counted all of the cars going both directions to see which would come out on top. Right, from now, three, two, one, go. SUV and an electric SUV bonus points. Now, I fully expected to be inundated with SUVs and they did completely smash everything, everything other than the hatchbacks. And look at these very scientific results. 81 SUVs, 25 estates, three sports cars, 27 saloons, nine people carriers, and 104 hatchbacks. A total of 249 cars in 15 minutes. So 32.5% of the cars were SUVs. And yes, that is a high percentage, but not compared to the 42% that were hatchbacks. Not exactly proving my point, but they did certainly smash everything other than the hatchbacks. But the stats globally actually prove something different. There are 230 million more SUVs on the road since 2010. I'll admit it, there is a time and a place for an SUV. Maybe you live in the middle of nowhere or on the side of a mountain and regularly to ford rivers and climb steep hills. It's the millions of crossover SUVs and the people that should have probably bought a normal car that I have a slight issue with. I really cannot see any reason why you buy one of these things over a regular hatchback or an estate car. And crossovers are the worst example. They're small, cramped inside, worse on fuel, heavy, have no more luggage space than most hatchbacks. And most of them are just front wheel drive hatchbacks on stilts anyway. Only when you lift them, you suddenly sacrifice the handling they did have, fuel economy, or sometimes even legroom and boot space. Even full size SUVs are baffling too. They're big, heavy, not very aerodynamic, which then means they need bigger engines to get them to actually move, which makes them less efficient and more expensive to run. Doesn't sound like much fun. And then having all that mass high up makes it inherently bad for handling as well. The Moose Test is a great example of that and you can watch our video on all the ones that failed. You then add super soft suspension and super light steering and you've got something that gives barely any feedback from the road. And that sounds like a nightmare for anyone who wants some sort of driver involvement from their car. But it's easy to forget that most people just want their driving experience to be as stress-free as possible and to have enough cup holders for all their iced coffees. And I know some SUVs are geared more towards off-road than Nürburgring lap times, but it's not like that's where they're getting used. And a Range Rover has an incredible off-road capacity, as does a Mercedes G-Wagon, but it's fair to see most of the ones you see are parked up in a city centre outside boutique coffee shops, where the biggest elevation change they see is a speed bump. So why? Am I missing something? Are we all missing something? Do SUVs come with some sort of pot of gold in the armrest? There has to be something larger at play here. That elevated driving position definitely has some appeal. Stepping into the car rather than stepping down is maybe a bit easier and being able to lord it over everyone else on the road makes some people feel like an absolute driving god. And all the stats suggest that SUVs are an incredible success story in the car industry. People love them so much that they've driven the estate car off the market. Recent reports have suggested that Mercedes won't even bother offering an E-Class estate anymore because of how well their ridiculous range of SUVs are performing. It's difficult to think of a manufacturer that doesn't offer an SUV. Imagine telling someone 30 years ago that Aston Martin, Rolls-Royce, Maserati will all sell 4x4s. <laughs> and despite Enzo Ferrari furiously turning in his grave, even Ferrari are getting in on it. Have a look at this leaked image. The BMW X5 was one of the cars that spawned the breed of SUVs that we use to today, but it wasn't quite the first. In 1999, the Range Rover was around, but it wasn't the same as it is today where every celebrity on earth has at least 10 of them. Mercedes had actually released the ML and even Lexus had an SUV out as well, both of which were selling really well. And that's why BMW wanted to join the action. And some thought it'd be criminal to build such a big, heavy, four-wheel drive off-roader. That's 
the last thing that BMW enthusiasts wanted, but it seemed to work. BMW actually wouldn't refer to it as an SUV, which stands for Sports Utility Vehicle, and instead said it was a Sports Activity Vehicle. The marketing department must have been working on that for months. That first generation sold almost a quarter of a million cars in its six-year production run, and that's a success in anyone's books. The X5 was popular enough that not only is it still around today, but what followed it was a never-ending raft from different sized SUVs from Audi, Volkswagen, and Mercedes. Of all the manufacturers, Porsche even joined in with the Cayenne. And that was a car that took a lot of stick at the time for looking like a 911 on stilts, which is kind of what they were going for, I suppose. It was a huge success for Porsche, who were going through something of a sticky patch at the time. One of the reasons for its success, aside from being desirable because it's a Porsche, was because it managed to stay relatively true to Porsche's sporting heritage. Yes, it wasn't a mid or rear engine sports car, but that would have been a big ask in a luxury SUV, also besides the point really. Porsche still slapped a Turbo S badge on the back of the original Cayenne and created a 500 horsepower, two ton super SUV. And that seems relatively normal now with cars like the Lamborghini Urus, and back in the 2000s, it was even more insane. The early to mid 2000s was the beginning of this new era of SUV. They were still big, heavy behemoths, but far more focused on being sporty. Range Rover introduced a sport model, BMW kept putting V8s in the X5, and even built the completely unnecessary X6 to be even more sporty. Is it, is it sporty? Demand for these cars absolutely skyrocketed. If someone saw that their neighbor had just bought the latest X5, they needed to get something bigger, uglier, and even more tasteless. Because everyone seemed to be in a race to buy the latest, biggest SUV, manufacturers were already seeing the dollar signs. Bigger cars and bigger wallets meant they quickly realized they could demand more money for these monstrosities compared to regular cars. Even though buyers weren't really getting more for their money other than some extra height, SUVs were still more expensive than sedans and estates. I guess it feels like you're getting more car. So bigger car equals bigger price, right? As an example of that, the basic X5 has a £20,000 premium over a basic 5 series. £20,000! All for a couple of inches of extra ride height. You could spend that money on some nice optional extras, a holiday, some airless tyres, and still have change left over. It's not much different in crossovers either. The Ford Puma is based on the Ford Fiesta. It has slightly more room, but it's not that different, yet you'll still need an extra £4,000 to buy one. It's crazy. If I lift my Golf, will I be able to sell it at a 20k premium? Maybe it's worth a go, I suppose. A lot of SUVs might be sickeningly vulgar and completely unnecessary, but they sell. And that's kind of what car manufacturers focus on the most. In 2019, they accounted for just over 47% of the US's total car sales. Sedan sales were less than half of that. You just can't argue with the numbers, and that's why it seems like manufacturers can't wait to release a new type of SUV at any given moment. There are big ones, small ones, convertible ones, coupe SUVs, fast SUVs, hybrid SUVs, and now electric SUVs. And if everyone could stop buying SUVs, that'd be great. It also seems to be the only thing that manufacturers advertise. Think about this. When was the last time you saw an advert for a normal hatchback? All adverts seem to be for Qashqai's, Dukes, Kajars, Pumas. I love that subject. Who's naming these things? Are they trying to make me hate the cars? Anyway, they're evolving at a ridiculous rate. And I reckon if I stand outside the office and count SUVs again in a year's time, that number would be considerably different. If you have an SUV, please do tell me why you bought it in the comments. I really want to read it, honestly. What made you buy over a hatchback or an estate car? Like, I'm genuinely interested to know.